OCD. These three letters are familiar to most people, even if they don't work in mental health. The downside of this is that there are a lot of misunderstandings about what exactly OCD means, with many people incorrectly using the term to refer to anyone who is neat, orderly, or particular about things. To understand what is actually meant by OCD, let's break it down as simply as possible. There are three core components of OCD, and luckily they are the three things summarized in the name itself. Cases of OCD are defined by the presence of obsessions and compulsions that lead to significant disorder and dysfunction. Obsessions are intrusive and unwanted thoughts that are often disturbing and unpleasant, while compulsions are specific behaviors that help to reduce the distress caused by obsessions. However, for people with OCD, this relief is only temporary, creating an endless loop between obsessions and compulsions that begins to take up more and more time, leading to ongoing distress, dysfunction, and disability. Easy enough, right? As with many things in psychiatry, the devil's in the details, so for the rest of this video, we're going to dive deeper into OCD and learn what is and isn't meant by those three letters. Because obsessions and compulsions are so central to understanding OCD, let's start off by making sure we know exactly what we mean when we use these two terms. First, obsessions are not just normal thoughts. Instead, they have a number of characteristics which set them apart from the usual stream of consciousness that most people have. To get a better feel for what an obsessive thought is like, imagine a young mother playing with her newborn baby. Suddenly, a random thought passes through her mind. You should kill your baby. She immediately reacts to this thought with a feeling of horror, as well as some anxiety about what the thought might mean, such as wondering, why am I having this thought? Am I a murderer? She tries to reassure herself by saying, that's ridiculous, that's not the kind of person that I am, and reminding herself that she's never done something like this before. While this initially works to bring her anxiety down, soon the thought comes back, which causes her to feel even more distress, as she now worries about what it means that the thought has come back twice. Her anxiety continues to rise, making the thought seem even scarier than it was initially. Over the next few days, she finds herself constantly haunted by this thought, and she's even started avoiding going near her child out of fear that she might act on the thought, even though she knows that she has no desire to. These intrusive thoughts have now become an obsession. Let's go back through this story and use it to illustrate each of the characteristics of obsessive thoughts. Specifically, obsessive thoughts are intrusive, mind-based, unwanted, resistant, distressing, ego-dystonic, and recurrent. Handily, these attributes form the mnemonic, I murder, a question which you can imagine this poor woman asking herself over and over. Let's break these down one by one. First, obsessive thoughts are experienced as intrusive, meaning that they enter the mind suddenly and without warning. This woman was minding her own business when suddenly this thought burst into her mind. Next, people with obsessive thoughts recognize that they originate from their own mind. This sets them apart from the auditory hallucinations found in schizophrenia, which are experienced as originating outside of one's head and are believed to come from the real world. Next, obsessions are unwanted, and people who have these thoughts often try to ignore them or put them out of their mind. Paradoxically, any attempts to suppress obsessive thoughts often seem to make them even stronger, and in severe cases, no amount of self-talk can make a dent in how frequent or intrusive the obsessions are. Next, obsessive thoughts are remarkably resistant to efforts to make them go away. If the thought of killing your baby could be resisted easily through self-reassurance, as this woman initially tried to do, then it would likely be regarded as an unpleasant but ultimately meaningless occurrence, a bit of flotsam in the stream of consciousness. However, with obsessions, these thoughts aren't defeated so easily. Next, obsessive thoughts are distressing to the person experiencing them. While most people have intrusive thoughts from time to time, it's the thoughts that are most upsetting, those that are felt to be highly inappropriate, disgusting, or immoral, that are most likely to develop into obsessions. This is illustrated in the fact that no one comes into an OCD clinic complaining about intrusive thoughts of cute kittens. Instead, the most common forms include checking, like an obsession about whether they forgot to turn off the stove, contamination, like an obsession that they will get sick if they don't clean their hands after touching a doorknob, symmetry, like an obsession that certain objects in the house have to line up exactly, and taboo thoughts including topics such as sex and religion, like someone who has recurrent blasphemous thoughts about having sex with religious figures. Most people with OCD have obsessions in more than one of these areas. Next, obsessive thoughts are ego-dystonic, meaning that someone with these thoughts is generally able to recognize that, despite being based in their own mind, these intrusive thoughts are not reflective of their true desires. 
The word egodystonic is used to describe this pattern as they are discordant with someone's self-concept or their ego in psychiatric jargon. Finally, obsessive thoughts are recurrent. Even the most disturbing thoughts will quickly be forgotten unless they happen repeatedly. Obsessive thoughts, on the other hand, continue to come back over and over again. It's this feature that truly defines them as a disorder, as the frequent recurrence of obsessive thoughts directly sets the stage for someone to seek out specific things they can do to help fight these thoughts when they come back, creating fertile ground for the development of compulsions. So that brings us to compulsions. Compulsions are neutralizing behaviors that people use to help calm the intense feelings of anxiety and distress that obsessions bring. You can remember this easily by thinking of them as calm pulsions. Let's illustrate the idea of compulsions with an example. A young man is about to go to bed, as he has an important exam early the next morning. As his head hits the pillow, he has a sudden thought, did I forget to lock the front door? He initially puts the thought out of his mind, but it won't go away, and he begins to feel increasingly anxious about what might happen if the door is left unlocked the whole night. To counter this anxiety, he gets up to check the door, which is a compulsion that immediately relieves his anxiety. However, as soon as he climbs back into bed, the thought suddenly recurs. Despite telling himself over and over that he knows that he just checked the lock, he can't put the thought out of his mind. His anxiety continues to rise until he can't take it any longer, and he gets up to check the lock again. This compulsion again reduces his anxiety. However, just like before, this relief is not sustained, and the obsession recurs the moment he returns to his room. He becomes increasingly frustrated with himself for being able to stop checking the door over and over, but due to his ever-rising levels of anxiety, he can't actually keep himself from doing so. As a result, he spends the next five hours repeating this cycle, which keeps him up all night and prevents him from getting any rest. The next morning, he fails his test as he's too tired to concentrate on the questions. In this way, the loop between obsessions and compulsions has set the stage for a pattern of behavior that leads to distress and dysfunction. As this example illustrates, compulsions work, but they don't work for very long. Instead, people with OCD find that the same obsessive thoughts just come back again, often at a higher intensity than before. This leads to further use of compulsions to neutralize these thoughts, creating a vicious cycle between the two. If anything, compulsions often reinforce the obsessive thoughts that necessitated them in the first place, effectively feeding the very beast that they were intended to defeat. This idea of a disordered loop is so key to understanding OCD that we should dive into it in some more detail. Take a moment to look at this image. What do you feel? If you're like most people, your initial reaction is that there's something wrong. This will most likely make you feel some amount of motivation to fix the error, in this case by turning the O tile 90 degrees so it will fit with the rest of the tiles. To be clear, there's nothing wrong about either the process of noticing the mistake or the desire to fix it. We use this process every day for dozens or even hundreds of actions. The key here is that the path from noticing the error to fixing it is a straight line. Once we've done the task, then we get a feeling of knowing that the task has been completed, which allows us to return to an unbothered state. However, for people with OCD, this pattern is not a line, but rather is a loop, with the error signal persisting even once the task has been completed. People with OCD have a deficient feeling of knowing and experience only a tiny fraction of the relief that most people feel upon completing a task, or even no relief at all. This, combined with the fact that obsessions are, by their very nature, recurrent, feeds into this pattern. This is what really sets OCD apart from its common misconception of somebody who's neat or orderly or perfectionistic. Someone with those traits would be satisfied once they fix the error, once they put the thing back in the place where they feel like it should be. In contrast, someone with OCD doesn't get this feeling of knowing and gets stuck in this loop. So when trying to diagnose OCD, look for a loop instead of a line. Now that we have a clear understanding of all three elements of OCD, let's look at the data behind this disorder, including who gets it, what happens when they get it, and what forms of treatment are most effective. OCD is a relatively rare disorder with a low base rate in the population, with around 1% of people having OCD at any given moment and up to 3% being diagnosed at some point in their lifetime. This makes it more liable to overdiagnosis than being underdiagnosed. Men and women have an equal chance of being affected. Onset of symptoms is often during childhood or young adulthood, with most people developing symptoms before the age of 20 and almost all before the age of 30. Symptoms often come on gradually, but soon become chronic and enduring. OCD is not an episodic disorder, and symptoms can continue for years or even decades if left untreated. 
The severity of OCD is on a spectrum, as some people are only mildly affected while others are completely disabled. The amount of time that someone spends thinking about obsessive thoughts or engaging in compulsive behaviors is a helpful metric for how severe their disorder is. For example, if someone is spending 8 hours each day checking the front door or washing their hands, it will be practically impossible for them to engage in any kind of work, school, or social life. Beyond just time spent, OCD can severely disrupt one's quality of life in other ways. For example, a patient with OCD may not have touched another human being for years due to fear of contamination, leading to frayed relationships and unimaginable loneliness. To help combat this, let's talk about treatment. The gold standard of treatment for OCD is psychotherapy, and in particular, a specific form of CBT known as Exposure and Response Prevention, or ERP. ERP involves encouraging the patient to expose themselves to the object of their obsessional thoughts without resorting to the use of compulsions to reduce their anxiety. For example, someone who believes that all doorknobs are contaminated and feels the need to wash their hands after touching one would be encouraged to touch a doorknob and then delay hand washing for as long as possible. The length of time between the obsession and compulsion is made longer and longer until the link between them is eventually broken. By doing this, people with OCD begin to learn that the obsession does not actually lead to the feared outcome and that compulsions are unnecessary for preventing harm. In cases where exposure to the object of the obsession cannot be done directly, like when the obsession involves violence, even just imagining the feared scenario via talking or writing about it can work as well. ERP is incredibly effective at treating OCD, and most patients experience large reductions in the severity of their disorder that last even after the therapy is done. Medications can also be used to treat OCD. Serotonin-boosting medications are the most helpful, with SSRIs being frequently used, typically at higher doses than when used for depression. A specific medication known as clomipramine is the single most effective medication and can be used in severe cases or when other treatments haven't worked. Compared to ERP, medication treatment of OCD has a few drawbacks, however, as it tends to produce only transient improvement in symptoms, with the disorder recurring once medications are stopped. Because of this, medication should mostly be used as a second-line option in cases where therapy has been ineffective where more rapid treatment is necessary, or where the patient is unable to participate in therapy for whatever reason. While treatment of OCD can be challenging, it is also incredibly rewarding, as patients can and do get significantly better in the span of a few months. Knowing that you are giving the patient back not only their peace of mind through removing obsessions, but also their time by negating compulsions, can make working with patients with OCD incredibly satisfying. Okay, let's recap what we've learned. OCD is defined by three things, obsessions, compulsions, and the disordered loop between the two. Obsessions can be defined using the I murder mnemonic, while the word compulsions can help you remember that the key purpose of compulsions is to calm obsessions. While OCD is the prototypical disorder that involves this pattern, there are a few others as well that are known as OCD spectrum disorders. We'll cover these in future videos, but for now just focus on understanding these three elements as well as you can. Thanks for watching this video. If you got something out of it, consider liking the video, leaving a comment, or subscribing to my channel for more content like it. I'd also encourage you to check out my book, Memorable Psychiatry, which does an even deeper dive into the mechanisms of OCD, specifically looking at why some people get stuck in this loop in the first place. Until next time, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day.